in section 3.2, we talked about measures of center. Um, give me examples of measures of center. What are some of your measures of center? Mean, median, mode, and then the kind of worthless one. Mid-range, um, we're never going to say mid-range again. From now on, we're going to stick. Mean and median and mode really tell us the center of the data. But we also looked at some examples and said, well, this mean may not be an accurate picture of the actual data because you have some outliers skewing the mean, either to the left or to the right. In that case, the median may be a better measure of center. Um, so not only do we want to look at those measures of center, we want to look at how spread out the data is around those measures of center. Um, not only do I have a person who made a 100 and a person who made a 10, where are all the other scores in between that 10 and 100? So we're talking about measures of variation and measures of relative stand standing. That's 3.3 and 3.4. The basic concept of variation is just spread, how spread out the data is. Consider the accompanying dot plot representing two different samples of IQ scores. Um, when students were randomly selected and tested from a um, variety of grades, their IQ scores were pretty spread out. Now, it looks like most students scored between a 70 and maybe 125 or so, but the, the IQ scores are pretty spread out when you just randomly choose students from different grades. Once you start grouping the students by grades, there's much less variation in the scores. And in that way, Jane, the word variation makes sense. You don't have to make, don't have to be in a statistics class for it to make sense that there's less variation or less spread in those scores. So, um, that's, that's just the basic idea of what variation means. <clears throat> the characteristic of spread or variation is so important in, in statistics, we have to have numbers that measure the things that are important. We don't want to just say there's a little bit of spread or we or there's a lot of spread. We want to come up with an actual number that tells us something about how spread out the data is. These sections cover four measures of variation and ran, relative standing. We'll talk about range, standard deviation, variance, and z-scores. Um, at least two of those we'll find on the calculator. Two of them are very easy to find by hand, but two of them we'll find on the calculator. You'll just need to know what it means when the calculator tells you the standard deviation is 2.7. Now, what is that? Is that a big standard deviation or a small standard deviation? We'll figure it out. The range of a set of data is just the um, difference between the maximum value and the minimum value. Like I said, if I had a group of students who took a test and the lowest score was 10 and the highest score was 100, then the range would be 90. That doesn't tell me a whole lot, though. It's kind of like mid-range in that it's only dealing with the highest score and the lowest score, and those may be very different than all the other scores. So. If we only know the highest and the lowest scores, range is all we can give. But when we know all the scores, we have better measures of distribution than um, the range. The biggest one that we're going to talk about the rest of the semester is the standard deviation. The standard deviation of a set of sample values is denoted by S. From now on, when I say, what does little s stand for, you're going to say sample standard deviation. Very important. You can't just say standard deviation because there's sample standard deviation and then there's population standard deviation, and they're not the same thing. We'll use sample standard deviation to predict population standard deviation sometime, but you have to know that little s is from the sample. It's a measure of variation of values about the mean, 
And then, of course, there's a round off rule, which you're not going to have to memorize because my math lab is always going to tell you what to round to. But like our measures of center, we round measures of variation to one decimal place more than the original data. So if our original data was to the nearest whole number, we'd give standard deviation to the nearest tenth. There's your sample standard deviation formula. And it is so exciting and beautiful. And the shortcut doesn't look a bit shorter than the long cut to me. They're both hideous. Well, this is what I did in 1985 or so when I was taking my first statistics course. That's how I had to find the standard deviation. I had to subtract each um I had to subtract the mean from each x value and then square that, and I had to add those up for all the different x values and divide by one less than, what does this little n stand for? Which number? Sample or population? Little n, lowercase letters are usually the sample. Um, so that's divide by one less than the sample size and take the square root of the whole thing, and that's the standard deviation. Well, now there's an app for that. There's a button on the calculator. And some statistics instructors have their students use the formula a few times just to make them really love that button on the calculator. I don't see that you really gain any understanding by using that formula, so I'm not going to ask you to do it. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to ask you not to do it and learn how to use the feature on the calculator that will give you that standard deviation. Now, um, this semester, there will be many times that I show you a big, ugly formula, and then I'll show you how to do it on the calculator. The calculator's always the fastest and easiest way. I wouldn't be showing you if it wasn't the fastest and easiest way. But I always have one or two students who look at the examples in my math lab and then email me and say, I can't use the formula. And I email back, you're not supposed to be using the formula. I know that that's what the example in my math lab shows because they want you to be able to do it with the formula. I don't care. So we're not going to use those formulas. Even if you click view an example and my math lab shows you a formula, you've got to think, ooh, but I have a button for that and use the button. All right, here are the same eight coaches' salaries. You probably don't have those in the calculator anymore if you um, cleared it out to do last night's homework, but it won't take but just a minute to put those eight coaches' salaries back into Stat Editor. So go ahead and do that. Um, stat, and then number one is Edit and enter those eight values. Well, then you have them. Yeah, you don't have to put them back in if you still have them from the last class when you typed them in. Just make sure all eight of them are right. Get rid of one if it's wrong and put the right one. You um, move the cursor down to it and then just press delete for that value. No, delete right there. And then we type in the new one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that after you get all of those values entered, you need to exit the stat editor before you do anything else, um, that's when we pressed second and quit to go back to a home screen. Now, where did we go to find that list with mean and median on it? Where was that list? It was under math. What did I have to get to to find math? Second and list. Second and then the stat button. And then move the cursor over to math. 
second and stat, just like you did last night to find the mean and the median, we're going back to that same menu. And yes, sir. Um, I, let me scroll down and see, but I don't, I don't think I've ever noticed that. Yeah, I don't think so. I think mode, you would have to just look at the data and see what occurs the most. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see the option for that. Um, but standard deviation is number seven at the bottom of the screen. So I get me I get the standard deviation in the same place I get the mean and the median. Just you can either scroll down or you can just enter the number 7. And the calculator is waiting on you to tell it what list you want to find the standard deviation for. I have mine saved in list 1. And that's what I got. Does anybody second that? Okay. I was just making sure I didn't have a mistake in my data, but if several people got the same thing, that's probably right. Well, thank you so much. Up for that. Um, show me your data. Go to stat. And uh, no, go to stat. Plain old stat. Um, and then enter. And then scroll down. Let me make sure you have eight values. Yes, you do. Um, that one's not right, though. We didn't have anything. Yeah, that one's not right. I think it was 810,000. Yeah, that was the 1.23. It is supposed to have 1.23 E6, but that 810 was just 810,000, not million. Now, I don't think that's actually going to fix that problem, but that's one of the problems. I'll come back to you. Um, so what is that? Three thirty seven thousand no three hundred and seventy one thousand five hundred and seventy four point five if we round to one decimal place. And I don't want the laser pointer. I want the ink pen. In my office, I can write on that slide, and it'll show up. Oh, why is it different here? I don't know. But write down that um, standard deviation. Just write it down on the slide. 571,000. Hmm. Five hundred and no three hundred and seventy one thousand five hundred and seventy four point five is the standard deviation. Now, right now, we don't know what that means. So what? The standard deviation is three hundred and seventy one thousand. That means nothing to me yet, but it's going to mean something in a few minutes. So just write it down now and then we'll talk about what it means in just a minute. Important properties of Standard deviation, you have to understand, and this is why some teachers have their students do the formula by hand to help you understand you're subtracting the mean from each x value. So part of that formula is calculating how far each value is from the mean. As long as you understand that that's what the formula does and that's what your calculator is giving you, um, I'm not going to ask you to use the formula. The value of the standard deviation S is usually positive. Well, if you think back to that formula, S is the square root of something. Isn't the square root of something always positive? Why does it just say usually positive? Can you tell me one number? If you take its square root, you don't get a positive answer? What's What's the number that you can take the square root of that's not positive or negative? Oh, standard deviation could be zero. So the first time I saw this sentence, I was mad at Triola anyway, 
And I said, why does he say usually positive? It can never be negative. It's the square root of something. And then I realized, oh, but it could be zero. What would it mean if the standard deviation was zero? No, it could be. Standard deviation could be zero, but you would automatically know something about the data if the standard deviation came out to be zero. They're all the same. If you had 100 people take a test and they all scored a 92, the standard deviation would be zero. There would be no variation among the data. Values that are close together, clumped closely together, have a small standard deviation. Values with much more spread have a large standard deviation. Now that 371,000 variation or standard deviation for the coaches' salaries, I don't know for sure, but that seems kind of big to me. That seems like a big variation. A big variation tells me that those co coaches' salaries were very spread out. I don't remember what the lowest one was, but the highest one was 1.2 million, and it was that was far away from everything else. So we got a big standard deviation because those eight coaches' salaries were really spread out. The value of the standard deviation can increase dramatically with the inclusion of one or more outliers. Remember the sentence, mean is not a resistant measure of center. That meant that an outlier can really skew it. Same thing with standard deviation. You take that $1 million salary out of the list and the standard deviation will be much, much less. So means and standard deviations can be skewed by outliers. The units of standard deviation are the same as the units of the original data values. That 371,000 is dollars because that's what all of our data was that we put in our table. So if our data happened to be feet per second, then our standard deviation would be feet per second. Same units. All right. The formula for population standard deviation is almost identical to the formula for sample standard deviation, except for you divide by the population size instead of the sample size. But again, we're not going to use this formula. What you really need to know from this slide is that this is pr pronounced the Greek letter sigma, S-I-G-M-A, and I probably... No, I didn't type that. Sigma, S-I-G-M-A is how you pronounce it. It's the lowercase letter S. The capital letter S looked like an E, and it meant sum of, but lowercase is the population standard deviation. So when you get to your study guide, you're going to fill out that very important section that says notation, and for little s, you're going to put what? Sample standard deviation, and you can't leave out that word sample. It's the sample standard deviation. And when you come to sigma, you're going to write what? Population standard deviation. Got to know the difference. That's going to be very important in later chapters.